chase that pole, right? Like only done or done by cataract surgeons. That's the next one. Yes, well, I'm looking forward to this. I, I actually uh, told Cole that his talk was three o'clock today, but he realized it was now. Um, well, I know we're running a bit late, so I'll try to maybe uh, skip some slides that Raina very nicely showed as well. But uh, my talk is micro glaucoma surgery. What the heck is going on? Uh, these are my disclosures. So I kind of have a position here where I feel like I'm debating two people, kind of like, you know, Julian here. On one hand, I have Julian, the, the great Spaniard from Madrid, who's arguing MIG should only be done by glaucoma surgeons, right, if I heard you correctly. Although I wasn't sure. At, at the end, it sounded like he was like wishy-washy, you know? Kind of, you know? So, to me, it sounded like that. And then we have the Stanford professor, Kuldev Singh, who is arguing MIGS is not essential in a glaucoma patient practice. So I'm trying to put this together and understand what exactly is the message here. It's kind of saying MIGS sucks and glaucoma specialists should do it. <laughs> That's the summary here. They're both arguing MIGS sucks and glaucoma specialists should do it. That's kind of the message I'm, I'm hearing here. And in fact, you're in good company. <laughs> But you know, we've seen innovation come and we've seen a lot of resistance, right? And it's okay, I mean, we wanna have healthy debates. It's normal, to, it's normal to do this. But we have to try to understand what is the answer. So we, we've heard this before many times, right? Make glaucoma great again. What does that mean? Well, this is when glaucoma was great. When we had medications and medications and medications, and we had trabs and tubes. That's what we want when we talk about make glaucoma great again. Who wants to make glaucoma great again? Well, we wanna know the truth. What is the fact and what is the truth? Well, this is, this is a bit of a shifting ground, right? As the great philosopher Frederick uh, Nutschu said, there are no eternal facts as there are no absolute truths. Think about that. I mean, it may be your truth, but is it the truth? Because we all come to this question as people who are biased, and I will admit my bias front and center. We're biased around people we are around, around our own confounders we have, assuming that, you know, that people have the same thought process that we do, and trusting Fox News over CNN or CNN over Fox News or BBC. So it's very hard to, to know what is right, and most importantly, we need to recognize our bias, and I don't think we talk about this enough. We show our financial bias, clearly, but we also have our own bias, and there are a lot of biases in medicine. It's normal to have bias, but it's also not normal to recognize it, because this can lead to us going down a wrong path. So we must keep an open mind, at least, to hear those that maybe don't look like us, or act like us, or speak like us, or come from a different way of thinking. We may not agree with it, but by understanding that, it'll hopefully make our position stronger. And this is an interesting quote. Leading innovation can be quite uniquely lonely and unpopular because most of the time you have to stand by yourself saying everybody sees the world this way and I see the world another way. Well, that's how it was many years ago. Probably Kulda feels this more today because as you saw from the audience, he's in the minority. But it's okay, this isn't a popularity contest. There is the so-called Gartner hype cycle where we, where we basically match expectations with time where we have innovation that's exciting, it's sexy, it's cool, it's high tech, and we get really excited. We expect a lot of this procedure, a lot of this technology. It's gonna, it's gonna save the world. It's gonna cure blindness. And we get really inflated expectations. And then we come down because we realize it's not the truth. We get disillusioned and we get discouraged and we get negative. We turn against each other. And then it takes some time for us to hopefully do the right thing gradually understand where this technology or where the innovation leads to, and we enlighten to the, to the right balancing act. That's what we hope to do. So I will, I will focus a little bit on, on the question of is MIGS essential or not to glaucoma practice? Well, what does essential mean? I mean, essential means it's very important to be able to do this. It's, it's almost, you know, standard almost to be able to, to offer MIGS. And the alternative is saying, no, it's not actually. It's not really important. It's not essential. Uh, that's the way I look at it. So you're going to hear Koldev, because I've heard him speak before on this and write on this one. You're going to hear him say, well, this is for glaucoma light. Most patients with glaucoma don't go blind, so why are we getting all excited about doing these procedures for people who have little glaucoma? Most people don't progress. It's unnecessary surgery. 
And there are three to five percent of people who do fast progress, and those are the ones we need to really be focusing on, which I don't disagree with at this point, for a procedure that can lower pressure to actually save them from going blind. And we have decades of terecolectomy data and not enough on MIGs, and MIGs promotes transactional medicine. These are the things that you may hear today. And, you know, we love each other, but we have to have some points to kind of have some drama. So you'll probably hear this, unless Koldev will change his talk. Well, the reality is today, even in the Western world, there's still a long-term risk of blindness from glaucoma. As patients living longer, we know this is still a reality, unfortunately. And we know that there is a significant lifetime risk of being blind, at least in one eye. The numbers are coming down, but they still are, in my opinion, unacceptable for patients that are toward the end of their life. So glaucoma is a progressive disease by definition, and blindness is still an issue. We must remember this as we debate this topic. And the reality is, in most studies we see, progression occurs in most patients. And it doesn't occur fast in most patients, but it occurs. And it also, in clinical trials, shows that, again, majority of patients, whether they're treated or not treated, progress. And I know Koldev shows this slide and says, well, one-third don't progress. That's true, but wait a minute, two-thirds do or more. What about the majority here? This is an early patient study here, UK GTS study, showing again that, you know, 20 to 35 percent of patients progress at two years. Now, remember, this is visual field data. And we'll talk about this as well. So 30 percent is a pretty high progression rate in my opinion, to not to, to decide to treat these patients. But you know, it's not just about preventing blindness. It's not just about fast progressions. And to just think about that is missing the point of treating glaucoma in 2024. You know, the interesting work in visual field is showing the relationship between driving cessation, reading speed, the fall rate, physical activity, and not leaving home increases as visual field loss occurs. These are not advanced glaucoma patients. Patients with mild to moderate glaucoma affects their societal behavior. So to only focus our attention on the patients which of course deserve the most attention, I'm not arguing that point, the patients who are literally going blind, no question, that is really critical. But these are patients that we cannot, cannot forget. What about visual quality? Contrast sensitivity is affected even in mild glaucoma. Even with patients who have mild visual field disease, they will show contrast loss. Contrast loss affects quality of vision, affects quality of life. So if we can reduce that risk, even in mild cases, we are hopefully achieving something for our patients. And even with patients who have relatively normal or reasonable visual fields, relationships exist between structural RNFL loss and contrast loss, even before visual field loss. So think about that. Reducing visual field progression is a good thing. We shouldn't be ashamed of that, even in early disease. And reducing structural loss before visual field progression is a good thing too, even if it's mild. You know, we talk about economics, we talk about you know, the rich and we talk about the poor, but don't forget the middle class. Because reducing droplets is also a good thing. And if you ask our patients to a T, they will all tell you that. And if you're not for MIGS or SLT, for example, then you, honestly, you're for more drops. You're for more drops. And that's okay, but you're for more drops. I'll put it quite blank, point blank. Of course, there are the anti-MIGS drop technique that you can use if you decide to go that route. And topical drops do affect visual quality. They affect quality of life. They affect satisfaction. This is a known fact for any of us who practice glaucoma, who see patients every day coming in with drops. They don't, they're not going blind, they're not progressing, but you know what? They're not happy. And you know what happens? You become not happy. And you become that crank of glaucoma specialist. Don't be like that. So our quality of life, thank you for laughing. Quality of life <laughs> treatment, treatment goals are important to think about here. And again, it's not about IOP, it's a lot about our patient. And I like the concept of patient report of outcomes need to do this more. And when meds aren't enough and, they ha and you have mild glaucoma, who wants a bleb for primary surgery when that's the only thing you have because MIGs are not essential? Is that all you can offer a surgery? A bleb? What else do you do? Cycloablation? SLT you've already done? What else are you going to do then? So then, if you're saying MIGs are not essential, then tell me what you're doing for this patient. A bleb? We, cannot get, we can never ever get rid of the risk of endophthalmitis, no matter what type of bleb we make. 
and that risk will continue for a patient's lifetime and is devastating. You know, we've seen in other, other areas of medicine where we have alternatives in earlier disease and they can often be used for the right patient population. And stepwise therapy is something I think that is useful. So MIGS is again designed to address medications more so as a surgical procedure. And they're designed to address some of the issues we have in our current treatment. We talked about this in the Q&A a bit. Compliance, adherence, ineffective adding medications. How many people come to our offices with three or four classes of medications when the evidence shows that adding more than one or two drops does, does, does little for IOP lowering, but maybe more for our own satisfaction? And the histopathology we spoke about as well. Secondary distal disease as we wait longer and longer before doing any surgery that occur with all this. And as I think is really appropriate to say, glaucoma is only young once. You have a chance to address glaucoma when you can do it most effectively when you treat it early, interventionally. And that's the premise of interventional glaucoma. And as Julian said, they work better, in fact, when we do it in non-advanced patients. We talked about evidence. Is there evidence and is it important and essential? Well, I like to put this one up here because back in the 80s, there was an argument to make that, you know what, there's no evidence to treat glaucoma. You know, David Eddy, the father of evidence medicine, made an argument that there's really no evidence to treat glaucoma. And in fact, showed, some studies showed more progression with treating than not treating, with drops. And that was an argument made. And that it, was a, it was a good argument because it spurned our profession to do the right studies to do the OS, the EGMT, the SIGIS, the AGIS studies to prove that actually lowering pressure does affect lowering of progression. So yes, we need to have the evidence. Uh, Verena went through this already. I'm not gonna go through all of these as well. We, she's already spoke very nicely about the evidence of mix, of having a protective effect on visual fields and secondary surgery that is independent of IOP. Independent of IOP. If I showed a new drug that was neuroprotection that reduced the progression rate of mild glaucoma 50%, everybody would jump up and down, and we would have lunch, although we're running late. So there's something about this that, just like with laser trabeculoplasty, that when we lower pressure and reduce medication usage, that there's something magical that protects the eye. And we need to get down to this in more detail, and that's why I think MIGS is essential. And it can be done cost-effectively, it can be done low-cost even, as we heard earlier. So, I think there is a role for these, and I'm going to just briefly talk about the fact that we often confound the discussion by arguing TRAB versus MIGS. This is not an argument between TRABs and MIGS. This is not an argument at all. There's a place for both of us. And even Koldev, in his young self, that was only a few years ago, Koldev, you changed a lot. Um, <laughs> while MIGS will undoubtedly grow in numbers, and that is a good thing, it will not completely be replaced the need for trabeculectomy, which I totally agree with him. The two classes of surgery can and should coexist, he believes. Maybe he still believes, maybe he doesn't. We'll find out. And Julian, I need you to get it to see a LASIK doctor. <laughs> Saying glaucoma specialist should only do MIGS is an elitist thing. And I know you're not elitist, brother. That's why you couldn't argue it very strongly, right? Because that is elitist, folks. You know, we're democratizing medicine. We're democratizing glaucoma treatment to the masses here because it exists in the masses. We heard this already. And as Julian argued, Cataract surgery is most commonly done by cataract surgeons. Cataract surgeons have excellent anti technical skills. Although some of them can't go on you, we've got to work on that. And comprehensive ophthalmologists typically see the mild to moderate cases that are probably most best served by MIGS. And most glaucoma specialists typically treat the severe, terrible patients, which aren't the be best MIGS patients, they're blood patients, for God's sakes. And some glaucoma specialists don't do high volume cataract surgery. So how are they supposed to do uh, FACO MIGS? So who should decide this? Is my friend Alex Topa, because he's seven foot four, we say he cannot do MIGS because he's too tall? Is that right? No, of course he can. Sure, his neck hurts. <laughs> his neck hurts, but he can still do MIGS. So it needs awareness and training, as Julian said. I don't like seeing all these cataract cowboys running out there and doing MIGS on everybody and doing all this shit. That sucks for all of us. And it makes us look bad. So learn it and do great work train, it's very satisfying. Choose wisely. The right patient, the right procedure, the right time, and the right surgeon. Finally, the biggest challenge I've learned is not the technology, it's changing culture and people and behavior. 
Now, I could be wrong, but that was my argument. Thank you very much.